So, <clears throat> Sherlock Holmes and his friend, Dr. Watson, they go on a camping trip. And they set up their tent and they fell asleep. In the middle of the night, some hours later, Sherlock Holmes wakes up and he shakes his friend and he says, Watson, look up into the sky and tell me what you see. Watson wakes up and he looks up into the sky and he says to his friend, I see millions of stars. And Holmes says to him, so what does that tell you? Watson thinks for a minute and then he replies and he says, astronomically speaking, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, it tells me that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, it tells me, or it appears to be approximately a quarter past three in the morning. Theologically, it tells me that God is all-powerful and we are so small and insignificant. Meteorologically, it seems that we will have a beautiful tomorrow. So he pauses, looks back at his friend, and he says, Holmes, what does it tell you? So Holmes is silent for a moment, then looks at Watson and he says, you imbecile, somebody stole our tent. <laughs> now let me tell you something. When it comes to the parables of Jesus, sometimes we try and read too much into them when they're actually just plain and straightforward. So in a sense, I should really just read the two parables I want to read to you this morning who tells a similar story and ends there and say, thus saith the Lord. And we can go home. But let me, let me elaborate a little bit and help Jesus out a bit because then you and I will really understand what he's saying. Mark chapter 4. Won't you turn with me to Mark chapter 4, either on your cell phone, on your laptop, or in your paper Bible. And I'm going to read it to us this morning. Mark chapter 4. We're going through the parables of Jesus and uh, we chose a few parables just to help us to understand a few teachings of Jesus um, in the New Testament as well. The parable of the growing seed is the first one. Now, if you go to the beginning of Mark chapter 4, and I preached on that two weeks ago, it speaks about the good soil or the seed, some Bibles say, that is sown on different kinds of soil. But now he comes and he talks about a growing seed. And I want you to understand that in, in the heading there alone is a message. The growing seed. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seeds on the ground night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts a sickle to it because the harvest has come. Two important things here that I will elaborate a little bit on this morning as we go on before I read the next parable. The heading, growing seed. The end here, a harvest has come. Then he goes on, Jesus tells them another parable. He doesn't elaborate much on these parables. I think they are plain and straightforward for each of us to understand. The parable of the mustard seed. Again he says, what shall we say the kingdom of our God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed which is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet when planted it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants. With such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. An amazing parable. Now I want to tell you something about the mystery of the kingdom of God. Something that you and I really don't understand. And Jesus is trying to tell in this parable and others that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ is actually glorious. It is actually amazing. It is actually a kingdom that is greater than what we can or are imagining. You know, I find myself, and especially in the days that we're living in, that I find myself thinking dark thoughts about the kingdom. And thinking all kinds of oh and e and ah oh kind of stuff. When actually there are phenomenal results of the kingdom of God expanding in the hearts of many people in the days that we live in. 
Bryce just came back with a team of international evangelists that taught uh, 300 plus pastors. And as they taught the pastors, they took them out every day or, the, or one of the days when they taught on the personal evangelism. And I think Bryce is going to preach on that next week. As they, they took them out on the street and they taught them how to just simply share their testimony and lead somebody to the Lord. I'm talking about pastors. And they shared the gospel. Bryce will give the detail and probably correct me because uh, I probably didn't give the correct details this morning. But he said that almost a hundred people, first time commitments were made that specific day on the streets in Zambia. Now let me tell you, his kingdom... The kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ can grow into a fruitful plant or tree that produces fruit in record time. And I'll take you back to that in a moment. But I want to tell you that Katya's word is so right for us this morning. It's exactly what I'm speaking about. And I typed it, if you don't believe me, that it's in my notes here. Seeds, my dear friend, must be sown. You know, nobody has ever gone into a shed and reaped a harvest. Nobody has ever gone into a storehouse where seeds are gathered for the harvest or for planting or for sowing and has gathered a harvest there. The seeds must first be sown. I think we're living in times. We need, we need to understand that the growth of the gospel is hard. It is true. You know, we, we, it is hard sometimes also to detect the growth, to trace it, and to understand the growth of the gospel. So some people come to faith, but it's true that many are falling away from the faith as well. Some new churches are established right across this world, but it's also true that some established churches are falling away and are closing at this time. If you've walked with Jesus a little while, you will realize as well that your spiritual growth is always, not always, flying as well. It's not always amazing, isn't it? There are some setbacks and some, some difficulties. And some of us feel that I just picked myself up from one difficulty and there's another one. Yeah, some of you are smiling or some of you are going, mm-hmm, that's just me. I go two steps forward and I go three steps back or hopefully not three steps back. This doesn't mean that growth is not taking place. It doesn't mean that growth is not taking It just helps us to understand the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, my friend, is a mysterious mix of humility and glory and power and weakness. That's the kingdom of God. There are times where there's a phenomenal harvest in our lives. I look back over my own life as well and I think, wow, there's been times where, where I saw such a harvest and other times where I just have to sow and sow and sow and sow. But in spite of this, I want to tell you something this morning. And I want you to hear me very clearly. And that's why I took the, the communion like I did. If you are willing, if you love me, you are willing to obey my commands. And Jesus speaks in this parable about his kingdom that should be growing. His kingdom that should be effective. Seeds that should be sown. And a crop, a harvest that should be harvested as well. The kingdom, my dear friend, needs to move on. It needs to move on. I know some of us come from a bit more of a reformed background. And with that background, you sit here maybe this morning and you say, well, you know what? That's not my responsibility. It's not my responsibility to make the kingdom grow. It is God's responsibility. I'm just here to, to live this Christian life. And God is here to make sure that his kingdom extends. Well, I'm going to tell you something and I will highlight a couple of scriptures to help you understand that that is not true. That that is actually not true. Because many of us do not understand the responsibility that God has entrusted to us as individuals to let his kingdom grow. It is very much in your hands and in my hands as believers. If you want to, otherwise you can just listen to it. Romans chapter 10 verse 10 to 21. 
Listen to the writer here. Paul writes and he says, For it is with your heart that you believe and with your mouth that you confess. Or, uh, let, let me go back. It is with your heart that you believed and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Can you get the package deal there? It's not one or the other. It's both. It is in my heart that I believe and I'm justified. It is with my mouth that I'm confessed and I'm saved. Now listen to verse 11 of that same passage. It says this, Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses those who call on him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Would have been nice if he just stopped there. But he doesn't. Listen to what the writer, listen to what Paul says in the next verse. How then can they call on the name that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And that's your job and my job. Not just the preacher, not just the evangelist. That is your job and my job in the world that we are living in. Verse 15 says, And how can anyone preach us unless they have been sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, the writer says. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 to 15. I'll give you another example. Where Paul writes and he says the responsibility of extending the kingdom. Let me tell you my dear friend. Rest on you and on me as believers. And if it fails and if it doesn't extend. You and I will be held accountable before God one day. That's the bottom line. Listen to 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1 to 15. And they were arguing, and he's writing to leaders here, the church leaders. And they were arguing, and the one was saying, I'm from Apollos, I'm from this one, I'm from Paul, I'm from that one. And there were all these factions of who was their real leader. And then Paul says, after all, man, what is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants. But, listen to us, through whom you came to believe. As the Lord assigned to each his task... I planted, Apollos watered, but God made it grow. Okay, so here's, here's a partnership. You are in partnership with the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me tell you, it seems like you and I have the full responsibility to sow the seeds. God will make it grow. But you and I have the responsibility to sow the seeds. Then Paul says, so neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. But only God who makes it grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. And they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers with God in his service. You are God's field. God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid the foundation as a wise, a wise builder. And, and I, want you, I want us to get it today, my, my dear friend. I want us to, to, to understand today, this, like I said two weeks ago, is not just getting saved and God puts you on this gravy train and with all the blessings that you can think and imagine, and one day you're going to get to heaven. I think we're missing the plan and the purposes of God. If we don't understand, that this is actually a rough road, a challenge with a great responsibility. He says, I have laid as a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. So what is Paul saying? I laid the foundation, Apollos is building on it. And that's cool with me. That's cool with me. That's what he's saying. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has already been laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's the bottom line. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, or costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day, referring to the day of judgment, will bring it to light. 
It will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If it has been built, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. You know, I wish that passages like this weren't actually in the Bible. But they're there. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet be saved. He doesn't say what that is, but it seems like there will be even in heaven, those of us who will suffer lost and yet be saved, even only as one escaping through the flames. Man alive, this is a warning for you and me, my friend. You know what? I give you a simple message th this morning. All I'm saying to you is look up in the stars and stop trying to interpret how complicated this message should be. Somebody has stolen our tent. And that's the bottom line here. The message, this passage is, what Jesus is saying to me is plain and simple. Many of us do not see our responsibility. And if we do, many of us don't take it seriously. We're all talking about my full potential in the Lord Jesus Christ and reaching my full potential. And you know what we mean by that full potential? And we, you know what we mean by, 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 by reaching your potential? Gaining and, and, and having success in your life is just self-enrichment, personal pleasure, and blessing for myself. When I look at the life of Jesus, my friend, his pleasure, his fulfillment was found when he laid down his life. When he laid down his life. And he gave it away for others. So most of our conversations when it comes to reaching the full potential and having success in our lives is contrary to what God's word is saying. I want us to take back to very quickly to a sermon I preached two weeks ago on the soil, the four kinds of soil. And all I want to say about that sermon in a nutshell is in the end, the fourth kind of soil was a soil that was well prepared and produced a harvest. And produced a harvest. You see, Matthew chapter 4 verse 20 says, Other like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, produce a crop 30, 60 and some 100 times of what has been sown. That's what it says. The first thing that we notice about this parable is that there's a similarity here because in Mark chapter 4, it speaks about the parable of the soil and then it speaks about sowing seeds and then it speaks about the mustard seed. All in one passage. And it speaks about producing a crop. And my friend, I read you a hymn a couple of weeks ago. I do not want any of us, and as your pastors, we don't want any of us to stand before God one day and say, save through flames, but nothing to offer you, Lord Jesus. Nothing. Nothing to offer you. You see, you say, well, Rulof, I'm producing a crop. Now, I want you to understand something here. The difference between fruit and a harvest. Galatians chapter 5 says this, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and all those kind of stuff. He said, I'm producing that stuff in my life, so I'm genuinely, I am showing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, so I am walking with God. Mark chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 13 does not speak about fruit, it speaks about a harvest. And a harvest is different to the fruit of righteousness. The fruit of righteousness I demonstrate when I walk in the Spirit with Jesus. My life has changed. My life has changed. You know, I often say to people, and I say it to myself as well, I thank God that I'm not the man I used to be. But I'm asking God to help me that I will not remain the man I am today. That's the fruit of righteousness. But Mark speaks about producing a harvest. A harvest exactly means the growth of the kingdom of God numerically. Souls being saved. And folks, I'm speaking to the barn only today. And there will be people listening to me all over as well. But I'm speaking to us as a church. Forget the rest. 
Are we producing a harvest of souls? Are we bringing them? And are we leading them? And are we sowing the seeds into their lives so that they will be saved? You see, I think this time has been an amazing time to reflect on the the actual reality of my faith. What is my faith really? Why am I in this walk with God? When God has taken away many blessings in our lives, allowed it to happen, I think the focus should be, and I am disappointed, disappointed that so many of us are not thinking this way. Lord, what about my effectiveness in your kingdom? What about passages like this where you tell me, if you love me, you'll obey my commands? I want to produce a harvest. You see, in this parable of the growing seed, Jesus tells, a man, tells us of a man who scatters the seeds and, and then allows the seed to take its course. You know, so often people say, well, God sows the seeds. No, you sow the seed. What is the seed? It is the word of God. Who makes it grow? It is clear God makes it grow. But I am the sower in this parable. I am the sower. You are the sower. And friends, as I read this morning from from Proverbs as well, a man that is lazy spiritually will not produce a harvest will not produce a harvest. So the man sows the seed. Then the Bible says he goes about his business. He just does what he's supposed to do. Sow the seed. And then the seed starts growing because that's God's business. God makes sure that these seeds are growing. And then it says, as he puts the seeds in there, God starts growing it and the result is there. It develops kernels in the head eventually. See, Jesus tells you and me, I am not responsible for your spiritual growth, but I'm responsible to sow the seeds in your life for salvation and spiritual growth. The soil in this parable all by itself produced a harvest. That comes back to the passage, my friend, of a soil that is well prepared A heart that is soft towards the things of God. We sow, but God makes them grow. So in Mark chapter 4, verse 26 to 29, it's clear that the sower sows the seed. And while he is asleep, it just sprouts and grows. The sower has little to do with the growth of the seed. And I'm not saying we shouldn't disciple people. We should be discipling people. We should be involved in that stuff. But it's God that makes them grow. And God makes them grow, but it also very much depends on the receptiveness of the heart. The parable ends with a harvest. The parable ends with a harvest. That's what Jesus is after. You see, Jesus doesn't come here just to save or just to spread a good message. His aim was to bring people into a meaningful, committed relationship with him. So so the process is here in my own life. A seed that is sown must grow and then must produce a harvest. The goal is ripened grain that reproduces itself in bringing others into a relationship with him. You see, the truth of this parable is well illustrated in the growth of the early church. Listen to what Apollos says. I planted a seed. Apollos says, I planted a seed. Apollos watered it. God made it grow. So often people say, well, God is not into numbers. He's absolutely into numbers. His his idea is that all people will be saved. That's his will. That's his plan. That's a numbers game. So when people are saying, you know, the only only, uh, thing that that church is uh, about is just to get numbers. Yes, they are absolutely right in just getting numbers saved. Because that's God's heart. The growing seed, the mystery is is that God uses His Word in the heart of an individual and mysteriously and completely independently from human effort then it grows. My job is to sow. Then he goes on and he tells the story of the mustard seed. I want to stop there for a little while, very briefly. I want to clarify very briefly this 
wonderful little seed that Jesus speaks about. He says one of the smaller seeds in your garden that is sown. And suddenly it grows into a large bush. And birds can go in there and find shelter as well. A mustard seed, my friend, needs the right soil, the right temperature of the soil for it to be sown in and to grow effectively. Now listen to this little mustard seed that Jesus is speaking about. A mustard seed, when it's sown in the right soil, under the right temperature, and so by the way, it's quite a cold temperature, about seven degrees. As that seed falls into the ground, it says here that the, 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 the scientist or biologist says that within five to ten days, that seed actually comes out of the ground, pops its head out, and starts growing. Listen to this. Within 30 days of germination, a mustard seed develops into a full canopy. And then another 30 to 40 days, flowers appear, pods develop, and seeds are formed. Less than three months, a little, 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 little seed that is sown develop into a tree that produces a harvest. There's a message for you and me. He says the kingdom of God is like that. I want to tell you today, small beginnings, small seeds that you sow can develop into quick growth, producing seeds. But there's more than that. The Bible says that is how the kingdom of God is. Nothing is too insignificant that I do in the name of Jesus. But I've got to do this. That's one of the main points here, is that the kingdom of God has the potential just to grow. To expand phenomenally. Romans chapter 5 verse 17 says, For by the trespass, listen to this, this is most amazing. For by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that man. How much more will those who receive God's abundance, provision of grace, and the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. My dear friend, just as one man caused death and destruction, the sin of one person, so, new life, and that's the good news, new life through Jesus Christ can change the lives of many. That's the gospel message. That's how simple it is. Small beginnings. I would love, I'm not a Billy Graham. God doesn't ask you to be a Billy Graham necessarily. Maybe you're going to be a bigger than a Billy Graham. But maybe you're just going to be the average normal Christian where God says, every day of your life, go and sow seeds in my kingdom. I find it amazing, and, and I, don't know, I don't know what Jesus thought, and, and I think very different to Jesus from time to time. Jesus goes out, preaches to the masses, but chooses 12. And among the 12, he takes three. And in fact, his success rate with the 12 wasn't 100%, humanly speaking. He lost one. One who... Failed him. Judas. So he takes 11 guys. Specifically three. And he says, this is my plan to change the world. 12 people who are serious about me. I wonder if Jesus would just pick 12 of us today. If in three years time, we will go and reach the world like the disciples did. I thank God that the Holy Spirit is at work in us and through us. From a human point of view, the gospel may not be spreading the way you and I think, but it is. It is our responsibility to make sure that we sow seeds of this gospel every day of our lives. Let me tell you about two guys in closing, two stories. Charles Spurgeon, I'm sure you've heard of Charles Spurgeon. He writes a whole thing about this parable of the mustard seed. And then he says this, I see the mustard tree. Listen to me, to me. He says, it's a very wonderful tree. I just put it in real English because he speaks with very high English. Or he spoke in those days. You know. He says, 
But I not only see, I hear music, music, the birds, the birds, he says. It is early in the morning. The sun is is scarcely up with torrent of songs in that way to produce music. Shall I sow mustard seed and reap songs? I love this. I shall sow mustard seeds now and get music in God's own way. You can interpret it the way you want, but let me tell you something, my dear friend. The Bible says when one soul comes to know Christ, there's a party in heaven. That's rule of interpretation. I think the angels tuck their little whatevers they've got in and they dance and they rejoice and God joins in. When one person, there's music. You know, it's like the birds go in this mustard tree and they hide and they find a, a, a comfort there when the sun is, 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 is hot maybe. But birds, when they're together, and I'm sure you know, they chirp. Yes, they chirp. And they sing. We were camping a while ago at, at the coast and, and, and the, the finches were we're making nests, and, and from early in the morning and through the heat of day until late in the evening, you could hear it. It was amazing, no, noisy, loud, busy. Seeds that are sown in people's lives make music in heaven. Let me tell you another story, and I close with this. D.L. Moody. Those of you who have read a little bit of church history and revivals will understand what I'm saying here. D. L. Moody didn't attend school beyond fifth grade. This is what is said about D. L. Moody. He couldn't spell. His grammar was awful. His manners were often brash and crude. And he never became an ordained minister. Once before his conversion, he so outraged an Italian shoe salesman with a prank that the man chased him with a knife with the intention to kill him. Yet, this life was used to lead thousands of people to the Lord Jesus Christ. How did it start? Listen to this. Dwight came to Boston as a teenager and he felt alone in a big city. The boy was desperate for work. His uncle took him to a shoe salesman. And on the condition, this was the condition, that he would be obedient to his boss and that he would attend the Mount Vernon Congregational Church. Now, Dwight came from a church where they uh, didn't believe in the lordship of, or, or the divinity of Christ and that man actually didn't need salvation. We will all be saved. Now, he heard those things and he was quite happy for that. And so he started to go to this boss's church. And his his view was, I will enjoy life and get saved just before I die. That was his view. However, now the children's church teachers normally come at night. But here's some good news for you. The kindness of his Sunday school teacher, Edward Kimball. Have you ever heard of him? Not. Have you ever ever heard of of Moody? Yes. Turned young Moody into his lifelong friend, encouraged him to persist in his church attendance and regular Bible reading. Though Moody did not read the Bible, he didn't try, he couldn't read. He could not understand much, he thought. Kimball later said he had never seen anyone whose mind was as spiritually dark as Dwight Moody's. This changed on the 12th of April, 19, or 1855. Kimball came to the shoe store to ask Dwight to commit his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Moody listened carefully and became a Christian on that day. Immediately began sharing his, sharing his faith with others, including his own family, but they wanted nothing to do with it. At first, Moody wasn't allowed to become a church member. Because he didn't give the right answers when the leaders asked him why or what Jesus did for, his, for him and his life. In fact, when they asked him and say, uh, what, what did Jesus do in your life? He says, I wasn't really aware of anything that he did. That was his first answer. And uh, so the leaders didn't accept him as a member in his church. Later, he moved to Chicago. He wandered in the streets and he began to preach to boys 
And he started a Sunday school class, just like his teacher did, the man who led him to the Lord. His passion for souls and, determin and determination never allowed him to walk past somebody and not ask them whether they were a Christian or not. And obviously some did not like this at all. But it says that this guy, who started out as a shoe salesman, led more than a million people individually to Jesus Christ. My friend, mustard seeds. Mustard seeds. Small seed. Go and sow some this week. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. Father, help us in Jesus' name to take your word seriously and be doers of your word.